Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the last forum lecture series of this semester. My name is Mina Chan, and I'm the Associate Dean of First Year Experience at MICA. I'd like to first thank the FYI team, affiliated staff, UGS, Office of Events, Communications, and especially Reb Green, Curricular Coordinator of Forum for her incredible work this semester. I've been working behind the scenes a little, so it is with such a distinct pleasure to say hello to you directly today. I've had the chance to meet with some of you in real life and look forward to getting to know all of you better continuously. As far as highlights go that comes to mind today about the semester is that in light of the fact that you have entered first year of college at MICA and endured your first college experience during a continued pandemic and that our MICA has opened doors after such a long time being remote is that I too have recently begun my position and that it has been my honor to walk with you, to experience everything as a new aside by you. It has been such a big adventure for me every day, actually. And I hope it has been that way for you too. I was beaming with pride meeting some of you during orientation, faculty meet and greet with AMA, ask me anything time. I remember when I was asked, if I was an animal, which animal would I be? And that I answered a cow. And that made some of you laugh. I explained that it was because I was born in the year of the ox 1973. And that made some of you surprised because I'm ancient. And then during Hurricane Ida, when the tails of it hit Maryland, and there was water leaking on the third floor of the main building. I saw you still show up for class. And the perseverance I saw you in that day from the beginning of the semester till now, I see your dedication for your education in your creative practice and the efforts you make, all the steps you take. So while I helped a little to organize this year's forum, with DIG goals while honoring our beloved faculty, Fletcher Mackey, who passed away this summer. I dedicate today and this last forum for the semester to you because you, the students, is what makes MICA great and to say thank you. I know this is an incredibly difficult time of the semester. Take care of yourself, pace yourself, communicate with your teachers, appreciate what you're gaining and be there for others, your friends, peers, and help lift each other up as we faculty and staff will try to uplift every one of you each day. The theme for December in our forum class is universality. We are all unique and different, but there is a commonality. We are all of the human race. We live on one earth. And today we're brought together with a common thread of our own established universe. And we're gathered here to learn from each other. And by that we're better for it because it is you who makes a difference in this world. You who are making a dent in the universe with your creative voice. So I'm honoring you and while doing so, I'd like to introduce two speakers today who share their unbelievable talents and are Baltimore-based and beyond. Cindy Chang and Jeffrey Kent, two faculty members teaching at MICA, are here to present their artistic individuality and universality. Cindy Chang, while she's from Hong Kong, she has lived all over the world including Vancouver, Hawaii, Massachusetts, and now Baltimore. These places are an important part of her art making and she uses structures and forms that reference the way we inhabit these spaces. Her multidisciplinary practice emphasizes how the forms influence how we move through the world. Check out her work at the Baltimore Museum of Art. That's, a, she's in a show currently out. Jeffrey Kent, 
His work is a passionate investigation of issues related to the political and economic foundations of freedom and the role of responsible citizenship. He explores the intimate experience of the individual interacting with the idiosyncratic, idiosyncrasies, excuse me, of their world, specifically the experience of the Black American citizen. Thank you so much, both of you, for presenting today. Uh, thank you, Mina, for that lovely intro. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, so hello to everyone. Um, I'm here. Uh, thank you to the forum faculty for inviting me and to all of you for tuning in. Um, so like Mina mentioned, um, uh, we've been asked to reflect on how my practice relates to the idea of universality, um, which we're all grappling with in different ways in forum right now. Uh, and when I consider uh, what the definitions of this huge idea could be, uh, I think of the things that we all need at a fundamental level. So one of the big things is belief or a belief system. Um, this is what binds us together. It's what gives us community, uh, but belief systems also contribute to uh, tribalism and has the potential to reinforce bias and prejudice. Um, I think belief itself as a thing is neutral. What makes it positive or negative is what populates um, or characterizes that system. Uh, and also like when we think about what's going on now, um, not just in this country, but also on a more global level, I think it's hard not to see that we're in this really strange place with belief. So right now in the studio, I'm preoccupied uh, with looking at conspiracism, um, which means not just particular theories, but the actual history and culture that sustains and propagates fringe narratives. Um, and I say uh, fringe narratives, but the insane thing is that conspiracy has become mainstream. Reality and facts have become debatable. Um, or even a matter of opinion and belief that is heavily informed by isolated personal experience is increasingly prioritized. Um, and this leads to a wild spreading of misinformation. Um, and this fantasy as reality has made it, in my opinion, um, a really important thing to look, uh, to look at a little more closely. Um, so I think I'm just gonna go over some of my recent projects um, that have come out of this interest. Uh, this is a shot of my most current installation, which is up right now, uh, like Mina mentioned, at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, and just to plug it a little bit, um, it also features uh, work from Lauren Adams and Latoya Hobbs, who are two other amazing MICA faculty members. And we actually had the pleasure of hearing Latoya talk about her practice a little earlier in the semester. Um, so the show is up until March, so if you guys have time and you're curious, definitely go check it out. So I'll loop back to um, talking about this particular uh, body of work a little bit later, but I wanted to start with some earlier work that uh, formed the foundation of my current thinking. Um, so my interest in conspiracism evolved pretty organically. I was making work thinking about how we curate our lived spaces in order to project a very choreographed sense of self. And then that led me to thinking about domestic objects and from that to personal objects. And then from there, I started thinking about things that hold meaning for us because they embody memories or sometimes even better secrets. Um, so then that landed me on this path of thinking about the potentially darker things that are embedded within our cultural objects and thinking about what could lurk behind an aesthetic of hominess or comfort or a sense of tradition. Um, also around this time, which was like the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018, uh, QAnon, which I'm guessing most people have probably heard about by now, um, so QAnon was just starting to gain more mainstream attention, but it was still a little bit fringy. Uh, I began thinking about how Q drops um, were spreading through such uh, sort of everyday things as Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and various podcasts and how insane it was that people could access these questionable things from their devices and from the TV and the radio 24 seven. So it was just like super easy to get drawn into these um, conspiracy theories. 
And then also at this early point, um, I was really more focused on um, looking at specific American con conspiracy theories rather than thinking about the overall culture of conspiracism. So doing a little bit more research into that, um, I found out that many of the core ideas that undergird the contemporary fringe was really consolidated and popularized by a man named uh, William Cooper uh, through his book, Behold a Pale Horse, and then also through his radio show called The Hour of the Time, which was broadcast from 1993 until 2001 when he died. Um, Cooper really did a lot of the foundational work of building a new infrastructure of belief um, by spinning these intertwined narratives around the deep state and then more occultish and outlandish ideas. And that, that was really needed um, to create this enormous community of quote unquote alternative fact adherence that we have today. Um, so for this particular piece, I took one of the lectures that Cooper delivered um, in his radio show, and then I modified it a little bit and embedded it in this object um, that was designed to look like an ambiguous domestic apparatus that could be used to disseminate uh, ambivalent narratives and secrets uh, within the home. Uh, and it's kind of difficult to see in the documentation, but you can kind of just see this neon bulb. Um, and I also put a fog, a fog machine inside the sculpture um, so that there was this vapor that was like building up uh, inside the blinds and it was kind of seeping out of them. And then that interior fog also created this uh, lavender glow because of the neon. So it looked a little spooky and a little occultish, which I thought was very fitting for the theme. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a one minute just uh, video documentation that I took with my really old iPhone, so it's not great, um, but I think it gives a, a sense of what the effect um, was when you combine the, the audio with the sculpture. The original lecture that I used that I pulled from Cooper is like an hour and a half long, it's really long, um, so this is just a one minute clip. Everybody look back in that corner at the far side of the room where it's real dark behind that chair. I'm going to turn on a very, very bright light and I want you all to watch the cockroaches scatter. For tonight, I'm going to read verbatim to you from a book that we found in a dusty shelf far back in the rear of a used bookstore. So many of these ideas around conspiracies and the often occultish narratives and mechanisms that are their vehicles um, became the focus of my next group of work, which I titled The Pretenders. Usually I'm pretty laissez-faire about how I deal with titles, but I wanted to be really specific with this body of work because I was thinking about how the spread and growing support for conspiracies was creating this new shady group of leaders. Um, some of whom may have completely bought into um, the belief systems that they were espousing, but many of whom were not true believers and were really, and are really only using the magnetism of these narratives to exert control, to manipulate values and priorities, and to essentially entrench their own power and their own ideologies. And in my mind, these leaders, like the beliefs that they peddle, um, are false idols, and they're kind of like pretenders to a throne. So um, inside of this uh, ceramic uh, hollow sort of icon head, I put a fogger. Um, so that vapor could kind of come out through the nostrils. Um, I've become really interested in having these sort of dynamic elements and chaotic elements in my work. So this and the next piece that I'm going to show were my first uh, sort of goes at that. Um, I like that the vapor and the water from these fountains, which I think of these as fountains, um, can act as metaphors for corruption and a loss of control. And then also I do like that with this piece, it seems as though um, the idol is breathing out this kind of pollution or spell that infects the space and the people who pass by. So um, this is sort of the partner piece to that. 
Um, fountains are still something that um, really intrigue me and that I'll continue to work because I feel that there are these weirdly manipulative things um, that are really good at creating a sense of idyllic ease and are, are also spectacles that are fantastic at conveying different narratives around myth, culture, wealth, power, and ideals. So I'm interested in twisting that around and having those objects become uncomfortable and questionable features that per perpetuate power narratives. Um, so these are just some examples of fountains that I kind of really love. Um, and when you look at sort of these, in, these kinds of environmental design elements, you can really see their capacity to promulgate myths of power. Um, and for myself, like even now being more critical about the motives for these elements, I'm still really drawn into them. I, I love, I absolutely love fountains and I, my gut is just to sort of like lean into their spectacle and into their charisma. Um, because they are a type of escapism, and I think that's um, a lot of their power. So just to name these examples, um, in case folks are interested in these, um, the fountain in the top left is the Trevi Fountain. Um, it's located in Rome, and it was built in 1762. Um, the fountain next to it is called the Swarovski Crystal Head Fountain, and it's called, also called the Giant. And it's actually um, the entry to Swarovski's uh, they call it an experience attraction called Crystal Worlds. And Crystal Worlds sounds kind of insane. It's made of 17, 17 underground chambers of wonder, um, some of which are located inside the, the head of this fountain. And each of them sort of rotate around a different theme. It also has one of the largest uh, Swarovski stores in the world. It contains what they call the crystal cloud, which is made with 800,000 hand mounted crystals. Um, it has a landscape garden, it has a restaurant. And even though I know that this is like some sort of homage to like luxury and wealth, I really wanna go because again, these are escapist monuments, you know. Um, the, the fountain below that is the Apollo Fountain at Versailles, which was completed in 1670 and commissioned by King Louis XIV, depicting the sun god who was um, King Louis' own personal symbol. So again, a monument to power and the self and ego. Um, and then the, the fountain on the left, the lower left, is called um, the Fountain of Wealth. Um, and it, it's located in Singapore at one of its largest uh, shopping malls called Suntech City. And Suntech City describes the symbolism of this fountain as, in quotations, the ring in the palm of the hand guaranteeing the retention of wealth. So I think the idea is that water symbolizes life and wealth, um, and the inward motion of that water represents the flowing in and the retention of fortune. Um, so developing uh, the pretenders led me to looking a little bit deeper into the wider world of conspiracy theories. And it really hit me how truly massive it is. Um, so I had to ask myself a more focused question in order to do that research. And um, that was uh, like, I asked myself, what are some of the cultural tools um, that conspiratorial thinkers and practitioners, because I do think that conspiracism is a practice. So what are some of the tools that they use to help grab and hold on to public interest in order to create a community and then solidify the support of that community around specific urges, which then enables them to spread um, you know, that kind of messaging outwards in order to consolidate their influence. Um, and then something that's become really evident is that one of the most effective users of such tools are actually evangelical uh, charismatic ministries, uh, because these ministries often exist to create in groups and out groups that are based on a moral order. And then also based around the myth that they hold vital knowledge accessible only to their communities. So you'd better be a part of that community. Um, I won't really, we don't really have time to get into the weeds of that because there is a lot of history um, around that. We could talk about that forever. Um, but this initial research brought me to um, the apostle, Gary Greenwald, who we see here. Um, and Gary Greenwald runs the Eagle's Nest Ministries, which is still functioning today. 
Um, and he was a, a propagator of this satanic panic in the 80s. And a lot of the paranoid ideas that he covers in his sermons still characterize much of the conspiratorial thinking um, that happens today. And this occult fueled panic seeped into not only the communities that were the viewers of this media, but also into the politics and into the mainstream. And it did that back in the 80s as much as it's doing so now. Um, so Gary hosted this sh uh, short talk show called Deception of a Generation, which is what this video is pulled from, where he interviews a man named Phil Phillips about the evil and often occultic nature of popular culture, um, covering things like cartoons, toys, and famously D&D. &D. Um, so they really focus on how children are being inculcated into satanic practices through these popular products. Um, and I used, uh, when I was manipulating this video, I used a really glitchy uh, program called Epsynth um, to animate Gary and Phil in order to implicate and fold them into their own propaganda. So I'd like to share this five minute uh, clip of what is a um, 10 minute video. And the original um, talk show is like, like an hour, 45 minutes, two hours long. So it's pretty, it's pretty long and it's, it's wonderful. You guys should watch it. But this is just a, a short excerpt that's been manipulated. Hello, I'm Gary Greenwald, and over the past several years, the Eagle's Nest Ministries has exposed certain things like rock and roll music, Dungeons and Dragons, marijuana, and even the New Age movement, and now we feel there's another attack upon our society. If I say something like wicked witches and demon clouds and spell books and even the zone of eternal evil, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Do you think of a coven of witches or a seance? Watch now. Wicked witches, demon clouds, where do we start, Mr. Van Gool? You start by getting that spell book before those foolish witches destroy the world. Oh, powers locked within this stone, transport me now to the evil zone. You know, you've been watching a Scooby-Doo cartoon and it's amazing to me to see what's being brought forth in a cartoon. We've seen spell books, occultic amulets. We saw a crystal ball, astral projection to the evil zone. All of this in a children's cartoon. Now, I've got a guest today. His name is Phil Phillips. He's from Texas. He has been involved in missions work in his life. And he has now felt called to study the effects of cartoons and children's toys and even TV programs upon our children today. And I'd like to introduce a young man. And uh, Phil, uh, God bless you. And it's good it's to see you today. It's a pleasure being here today. Gary. Now, Phil, I'll tell you what. 14 years ago, Scooby-Doo was a lot different than what we see today and I could hardly recognize it. Can you tell me what's going on in this cartoon? Yes, there's a vast movement toward the occult within the cartoon and toy industry. Most people don't realize that 80% of all cartoons deal directly with the occult, and 40% of the toys on the market have occultic influence, and these are the most popular. Now, you have a concern. I know that all of this is affecting our youth, and I wanted to know, do you feel that there are a lot of children that are being influenced by the cartoons they watch? Oh, yes. Uh, take, for instance, a cartoon like He-Man and Masters of the Universe. It can be seen as many as 31 times a week in an area with a viewing audience as much as 16 million children each time it's aired. And so we're seeing a vast effect on the whole United States and other countries around the world through these cartoons and toys. Millions of children now watching occultic cartoons and then going out and buying occultic toys. Now, could we say that there is witchcraft and occultic practices that are actually being portrayed in these cartoons? Oh, yes. The witchcraft and, and occult practices are not make-believe. They're taken from actual witchcraft, actual pagan religions, levitation, mind control, astral projection, and other forms of, of witchcraft ceremonies are portrayed within the cartoons. The children receive this in a, in a very different light than we do. Well, Lynn, before we talk about that, let's go into another Scooby-Doo cartoon and let's see some of the occultic and witchcraft influences that are very blatant in this cartoon. Let's go to Scooby-Doo again here. Okay. I can hardly believe what I'm seeing here. Now, we're looking at occultic things. We're th seeing things like the chest of demons and witches and Stonehenge and occultic uh, 
spell 13. I mean, we're talking about satanic things here. Now, Phil, you're saying a child actually projects himself into the toy. The, the toy is a lifeless hunk of plastic, and it only comes to life with that projection of the imagination into a toy. Yeah. And they give it life, character, abilities, talents, and set the surroundings around the toy. Well, we've seen over the last several years a, a slow, subtle, uh, occultic influence in our cartoons, but it's become so blatant. When do you feel this blatant turn towards the occult and witchcraft really took on its momentum? Well, there's a cartoon called... Make sure that you click on that button right now to subscribe so that every time a new YouTube video comes out and we're putting it out, you are the first to get it. It's just hot off the grill, as I'd say, and it comes straight to you. It's a now word from God. So it's not just something, and I believe that you can have something from a year, two years, 10 years ago that's still anointed, but I love it when you have a rhema word, a right now word, so I can notify you and say, here's what God is saying right now. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, so that video became the anchor for this most recent body of work. Um, and it's rear projected um, onto this facade. And this is kind of like what it looks like. This again was just taken on my phone in the space, but it gives you some sense of um, what that projection, how that works. Um, and when you look through this sort of like gap in the middle of the projection wall, um, you look through this crystal uh, screen, this crystal curtain, and can sort of see this interior den, so this kind of like li living space through that aperture. And I wanted to create a sculpture that plays off um, domestic interiors, and that comes across as a somewhat uh, overly ripe, um, unhealthy, uncomfortable space, and a space that, that's being isolated, that's being made inaccessible, that's being infected and changed. Um, I was really interested in playing around with two particular ideas. Um, one was how any manifestation of truth, um, as long as it is grounded in belief, and it doesn't matter how that belief was constructed, um, can restructure one's perception of reality. And then two, how one of the most powerful tools, conspiratorial communities, uh, which are really uh, cult communities, um, how one of their most powerful tools um, is the myth that they alone hold any real knowledge. And that knowledge is accessible again, only to their in-groups. Um, I also recently came across um, this 70s psychedelic mystic, uh, Terence McKenna, uh, who had some influence um, on QAnon culture. Um, and I think this quote from him really kind of cuts to the essence of conspiracism and why it's so seductive and so persistent. Um, and I think it also speaks to some of the, uh, the things that I was thinking about in developing this installation. So McKenna says, uh, what's really important is the felt presence of direct experience. Stop consuming culture. We have to create our culture. The nexus of space and time of where you are now is the center of your universe. What is real is you and your experiences. I kind of love that quote. I totally see why it's so attractive. Um, but I also think that it's this kind of individualistic, anti-authority, anti-intellectual, anti-critical worldview um, that I think is part of the DNA of conspiracism and is one of the re reasons why it's so difficult to pin down and confront. So as I continued developing the work um, for this show, I also continued to trace back narratives. Um, and that led me to this final artifact that I want to share with you all. Um, and this is, uh, this piece sort of uh, is, uh, references, it takes inspiration and uses um, an ancient Gnostic poem called uh, The Thunder Perfect Mind, which was composed in Greek um, and dates to probably around the year 320. Um, and the poem embodies a lot of the ethos of conspiracism. So things like uh, paradox paradoxical and dichotomous thinking. And I think interestingly, it's also delivered in a feminine divine voice. Um, so this entity in the poem speaks of being 
knowable and unknowable, shameless and ashamed, strong and afraid. And we see the same kind of flexible thinking in today's conspiratorial communities where adherents and their leaders are both powerful and oppressed, or the victim and the victor. Um, I think these leaps of self-perception and worldview are necessary to stoke and continue stoking um, and sustaining the fear, the outrage, and the urgency that I think is really vital for the continued relevance of conspiracism. So for this piece, um, you can see here, I've taken stanzas from that poem and written them out in the beating of these garlands. So moving forward, I want to look closer at the actual material history of conspiracism. For me, the fact that this practice has been uh, has used uh, things like literature, like that poem, but then also a lot of art, architecture is really important, design and digital and popular media, um, all of these things uh, conspiracism has used to hide in plain sight and continue to influence society and even politics over centuries. And for me, that's one of the most bizarre and compelling and disturbing aspects um, of this type of thinking in these communities. Um, and it's something that I want to learn more about. Um, so also as my research progresses, I want to begin um, archiving information so that hopefully um, that can help me gain a much clearer understanding of the trajectory of this really insidious belief system. Because Currently, um, while there is thankfully this like growing scholarship around the influence of this type of thinking throughout history, that information is still really dispersed and there isn't a lot of connective tissue. So that's kind of what I'm interested in doing moving forward. Um, so that's where I'm at with my practice. Thank you um, all again for being here and listening to what I have to say about um, my work in conspiracy theories. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Kent. I guess I'm supposed to start. And uh, I'm a Baltimore-based artist, as I mentioned earlier. And I like to talk about my work, my process, and uh, and I like to show you a couple of things that I've been working on as well, momentarily. I'm sitting here with my assistant, Cleo, who I kind of need to do everything for me, except make my art. Uh, one of the things that I will show you is the paintings in, behind me are paintings that I'll talk about some of the things that I have been working on, and then I'll finish with the things that I've just completed, which are the newer works, and then where I'm going later uh, with my art practice. I'm gonna have to start this here. How do you do I did that wrong already? I did that wrong already, y'all. The share of the screen magic. Okay, well, I put the other. All right, so here we have uh, a painting that I did in 2011 about, I guess in 2010, after I graduated from Micah uh, School, Hofburger School of Painting, I started working on this uh, series of paintings based, that was informed from a conversation or inspired from a conversation I had uh, with someone around my history in Baltimore and the history of Henrietta Lacks, who was a black woman who had uh, cer cervical cancer and she died at Johns Hopkins and her cells did not die. And she, this is the first time that this had happened in human ever. And uh, Johns Hopkins uh, cultured her cells and these cells are still being used today to help find cures to many, many viruses, diseases, and all things of that nature, including COVID, uh, HIV, polio. There are so many studies. As a matter of fact, I believe 
anything that's studied for us humans to be alive and stay alive as long as possible, HeLa cells are being used. Now, the thing about it, the thing about it is that no one in her family had given permission for her cells to be used. No one knew that this was, these cells were from even a black woman. This happened in the early 50s, I believe. And, and she, uh, when she died, of course, there was a colored section and a white section of the hospital. She was in the colored section. And black folks weren't being, didn't have the rights or the considerations of white folks. And in this particular case, no one in her family ever knew that she, her cells were being used. That's the first thing, it was done without permission. And in the very beginning, because no one knew who these cells were from, they used the name of a woman named uh, Helen Lane, I believe it was. And uh, for many years, it was thought that these cells came from Helen Lane until uh, quite recently, uh, a book by uh, Rebecca Sleuth, uh, The Immortal Cells of Henrietta Lacks is how these paintings were developed or this whole story for me was developed. So I started uh, these paintings. These are acrylic based paintings with impasto. This is, and they're used with GAC, a GAC 800, a Golden's product. And, and the way I use this product, I was informed by Sam Gilliam. Uh, he was the artist in residence at MICA for my first year in 2008 at MICA. And so in my research, I started Googling uh, Henrietta Lacks and the things I would find were, I was trying to figure out what I would do with Henrietta Lacks. Uh, the things I wanted to find in, in working in my, for, with my process is, is based on research first before I can go into the studio. And that's kind of where I am right now. I'm not really making anything physical myself. And so the first thing I did was to go and research what is Henrietta Lacks, who is Henrietta And I learned about mitosis and the fact that HeLa cells are cancer cells. And that's one of the reasons why they're able to be used basically until eternity. For some reason, this particular cancer cell is very powerful. And this is a, a microscopic image. So all the paintings that I did in this series are based on my research and mitosis and microscopic imagery. So these are forensic microscopic imagery, this that we see here. And then I went in the studio and made these two paintings. Uh, these are two paintings that I call, this is a diptych that I call uh, Split Decisions. And is really about the whole conversation of mitosis. And so these are some of the images that I called from the internet that I use as inspiration. As you notice, the images that I'm showing you that I researched in the paintings do not look alike. Uh, but what I did was through videos, of the cells online on YouTube and from looking at images of microscopic imagery, I used them as inspiration for the energy that I would put into producing the paintings. Because first of all, they're paintings. They're not portraits of something. They're just abstract paintings that are informed by an idea that was inspired by reality that affects us all. And the fact that her family wasn't notified until the millennium <laughs> is mm -hmm. atrocious. Mm -hmm. 
And we all know why that is. And so one of the things that happens in all of these works uh, is that they're action paintings. And so in the production of the paintings, what I am doing, oh, the video is not playing. Yeah. I guess in this slide presentation, it won't. So I'm going to do it differently. Come back to that. Let me see here. So one thing I do, I try to do, is not stress about stuff. And so what I'm going to do is take a moment, because I want to show you. No, I don't want to stop sharing, but I want to see if I can play this video. See there, I can do it. Oh, that's the wrong video. No, that's the video version. Okay. The portrait. This is what I was trying to show you. Uh, this is a portrait of Henrietta Lacks here. It doesn't show mm -hmm. the slide. Ah, there we go. There's a portrait of Henrietta Lacks here. And uh, this would probably be the first thing I saw when I started doing research on Henrietta Lacks. And because my work is mostly conceptual in the fact that I don't use, uh, I usually don't paint people, uh, figurative people. And I usually try to explore different ways to uh, work on a subject. That's when I started digging deeper into the, science, the scientific knowledge of the cells themselves. But here, is something that is more recent and it, it's informed and inspired in a similar way. Uh, in 20, ooh, when was that? Maybe 2015, 2015, the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation sponsored an undoing racism workshop at the Motor House. And in this workshop, there were, it was, diverse okay there were people from every walk age limit every race every gender and throughout the three or four day process i learned a lot and one of the things i learned was the wheel of systemic racism and how and in doing so and learning about that and all the different factors one of the things that came up in our talks were reasons you like being the race that you are. And everyone simply wrote on a postcard without their name, things they like about being the race that they are. You should try it. And the thing that was common, there was a lot of things that came up. It was very interesting in the differences that would come up and you could tell basically who were writing these things. Uh, and from that, years later, which is what happens with me, sometimes it hits me years later, when I was working on my autobiography, which is what I'm doing now, the current work that I'm working on is an autobiographical coffee table book. I'm dyslexic. I have learning differences, ADHD, whatever, I have it all, okay? Uh, you made me notice in my talk here that I may be fidgety or going back and forth and stuff. But... The way this works is that in my autobiography, I'm in a chapter called Innocence Loss. It's a time before I became, quote unquote, a Baltimore thug, which is the word that was used some time ago during the uprising that we had here in Baltimore in 2015. I guess I was maybe nine or between nine and 11 years old, the kids in our neighborhood, most of which were our dads didn't live with us. Uh, we were our parents and the, our best friends and everything. And one of the things we did, we would get these race sets when we were young. And I guess you can't see this now in the little small screen, I can show it again. But this here is an AFX racetrack from the 1970s which is when I was around nine, nine, 10, 11 years old or so. And we would get together 
get it, put all our tracks together and we would make one of these large sets like this. And we would race for a few hours. Then we would go outside and play Skelly, which was a street game. And I wanted to inform my autobiography about that part of my life, of how we did fun things that we found exciting. But I also wanted to include art history in this work. Also wanted to include my history and the history of pretty much us all. And in doing so, what I came up with was this red line that separates these two races because redlining came up in the Undoing Racism uh, workshop, which I had no idea that was a thing. Look, Google redlining and you'll learn more about redlining uh, because basically it, there was no written line, but there was on maps that were handled by the uh, insurance companies and the banks and the financial companies. And basically what it did, if you were black, you were on one side of the red line, which means you probably couldn't get a mortgage no matter how good your credit was. And you couldn't buy a home in certain neighborhoods because of your race. And these neighborhoods, these they just separately move in separate directions because of so. Uh, if you notice in the image on, I don't know if it's your left or right, but the larger size image under the track where the police car is, there's a 0% finance sign. Uh, this is all hand painted, by the way. I hand painted all of these tracks. There's 72 of them. And I, I, I chose to create, show the opposites of both sides of the red line. So you have no down payments, 0% uh, financing on one side. And the other side, you have 72 months financing with 5K down. Okay. And you could have the exact same credit, but because you're on the other side of red line, that's what you deal with. And the name of this work is called the rigged race. So this is a work that actually functions as a moving functioning artwork sculpture. And which the car, I guess you can see this because we're sharing screens. I could have did that the first time. <laughs> Move the cursor, duh. So we have this uh, Mustang car. Both cars are the same, by the way. And you can't see the other car, which is painted, quote unquote, flesh tone, which was in the crayon box when I was growing up. Uh, the pink colored white tone, white skin tone is called flesh tone when I was growing up. And then you have this car, which is, whoops, Daisy, how did that happen? Then you have this car, which is colored, which is my favorite word for explaining all races, because everybody's colored. No one's black and no one's really white. So the colored car is detained by a police car during the whole race. And while the white car continually laps the colored car. Hold on. It's muted, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's muted. I want to slow it down a little bit. There we go. And hit that button. Bingo. Oh, wow. That's what I needed. Look, wait a minute. What's going on? This is the wrong video. That sucks. That really does. Interesting. Okay. I did too many videos of this. So this is an installation shot of Rigged Race. Uh, but this also is an installation shot of my latest this this rigged race, as you already noticed is supported by European art history books. And uh, these books don't have people that look like me. But also in this exhibition are black artworks. So this is a this work 
It's also based on innocence loss when I was a, a kid, nine, 10, 11 years old. What if I can pause this? Whoops, that didn't work either. Oh, well, so it's like. But anyway, the, uh, that built that, uh, the, uh, that there. There it is, that works. <laughs> That's called Hood Hoop. And this is a resin sculpture. So this is the first sculpture I ever had casted. So this is all black resin. And most of the works that I did in this part of this chapter are works that are black on black on black. And so we have a resin casted basketball. I can't enlarge it, huh? Whoops. And that's a resin casted milk crate. And that's a cast resin piece of wood. That's not wood. That's not a milk crate. And that's not a basketball. They're all casted in mold and made it with resin. I could do the same thing in bronze, which I plan to do another edition in bronze. So this is an AP with an addition of three. And uh, that milk crate, I just like to talk about the specificity in the way that I construct a work of art. I could have just went across the street, there's a grocery store across from my house and got a milk crate from them and just did use that milk crate, right? But the way I work and what I learned, because I was self-taught until I went to MICA for the, my master's. I, I, I had never earned a, a BFA. I was fortunate enough to be accepted into the Hofbrecher School of Painting uh, without a BFA. So I ended up picking up a lot in those two years. And one of the words I, I learned was specificity. And it's probably the, the word that's most, it's really the action, I guess, that's most used in the production and process of me, of my making of artwork. And so this milk crate, I researched online and found a milk crate from 1974. And it's a Cloverdale milk crate, which is also very specific to Baltimore. Uh, Cloverdale, Cloverland, it's not Cloverdale. <laughs> Cloverland, this is the milk company that has, I think it's in, per, in perpetuity. I said it right. <laughs> they have in perpetuity with the city of Baltimore to serve milk, cow's milk, by the way, mostly, mm -hmm. I guess, only, to Baltimore City and Baltimore County children. And they still do it today. And this is what I had, you know, it's the milk cartons that we had in school in elementary, my free lunches, we would get this clo Cloverland milk. And so I just decided if I was gonna get a milk crate, it needed to be specific to my story. And so I went online, I guess I got it from uh, eBay. I probably paid like $75 for something I could have got free. But this is the work, I'm an artist, and I want my work to be very specific and detailed and in any way, shape, form. Uh, and so the other works that are in this book, it's far away, uh, is this neon. This is another piece that I had fabricated. Uh, this work is informed by a video that I saw at the New Museum, I believe it was, uh, about five months ago. It was a Titus, Titus, uh, Arthur Jafar. <laughs> it was a film by Arthur Jafar and there was a clip with uh, Serena Williams for about three seconds or four seconds doing a crip walk. And I came to tears because growing up, in Baltimore, which from my neighborhood, we call Little South Africa growing up in Baltimore. There's a thing called code switching. And most black folks do it, or most people of color, I should say, not just black folks. Most people do it, but mostly people of color do it to fit in to the corporate sector or the work sector to get jobs and to fit in with these jobs. 
as opposed to being your full, authentic cultural self. And when I saw her do that crip walk, after it looks like she won the Wilmington or one of her multi-championships that she's won, it brought a tear to my eye to see a black person being authentically black. And I've started this work here. And since I'm dyslexic, uh, one of the signifiers in my work is that I write backwards. My, my text is written backwards. So I use reverse text in my work. And so I got this neon made in which it's uh, also inspired by Glenn Ligon's America and his work. And so some of the things that I did different was first of all, reverse the text and I added the background, which is all black. And I painted, well, I didn't paint it, but I had the uh, neon painted black and they have a pinstripe in the back that illuminates light onto the black surface. And I believe that may be it. Wow, that's like perfect time. They don't make no sense. <laughs> How do I, let's see, stop sharing. Bam. And I wanna thank Micah, uh, Mina, Reb, everyone for this opportunity. And I think you should enjoy life. Don't stress. That's what I'm telling you. That's my last word. I'm out. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attention and participation. It was really, really wonderful to hear from these two incredible artists. And what a great uh, finish to the Fall 21 lecture series. Thanks so much. We'll see you next semester. Take care. Thank you.